Welcome to the Hunting Beast Podcast, your source for hunting tactics, news, and stories. And now your host, Mario Traficante. Hello, and welcome to episode 6 of the Hunting Beast Podcast. Today, we will be discussing whitetail tactics with well-known Hunting Beast member, Josh Beeman, also known as Bucky on the forum. All right, well, welcome to this week's podcast. Today, we have another well-known member of the Hunting Beast Forum, Joshua Beeman. Uh, Josh is better known as Bucky on the Hunting Beast Forum, and he's made a reputation for himself for coming in with some bigger bucks year to year and using tactics for hunting on various properties, not just focusing on one property, as well as utilizing uh, trail cams. And he's, uh, you know, he works a full-time job like most of us and is a busy family man, so he's also able to do this while balancing all those things. So uh, we're excited to get Josh's input on some of his tactics and how he gets this done year in and year out. So with that... Josh, take it away. Well, hello to everybody out in the uh, uh, hunting beast world. I just wanted to say uh, today is December 30th, so Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, I guess to start with, I'll just kind of give a little bit of background of where I grew up and kind of how I started hunting, I guess. I grew up in Berlin, Wisconsin, uh, kind of the central of the state. My grandfather still lives on the Fox River, just north of Berlin. He has a 100-acre farm that has very limited timber on it, but with the river, it has uh, a bunch of wildlife. So as a kid, you know, I had exposure to shooting and hunting at a very young age as, as well as fishing. And primarily, we did it for for food. So mm-hmm. spent a lot of time rabbit hunting, squirrel hunting, and then you know, later on progressed into the deer hunting, although my grandfather's farm is not a real uh, great spot to deer hunt, but it does have deer that pass through, you know, along the river occasionally. So that's kind of where I started with the hunting portion of things. Uh, Currently, I live now in Appleton, Wisconsin. I work for Theta Care, uh, the hospital's up in this this area. I'm a clinical pharmacist. Uh, My wife's name is Lindsay. We met in high school and both went to college in Madison together and we currently have three children uh Garrison my son Garrison my daughter uh, Gabby and my youngest daughter Madeline that's kind of a little bit of a background of you know who I am and where I came from I guess yeah so we uh talked about this a little bit earlier you know I I grew up and started hunting with my dad on a similar piece of property or situation where it was a kind of a tight-knit group of guys that hunted a single property a smaller piece of property Um, how do you you know how do you think that's different I guess was that an advantage for you growing up with with not all this widespread information about there about deer hunting and kind of learning from a select group of people on a smaller piece of property and and actually you know getting involved with wildlife and and pursuing other aspects of being out in nature and things like that that weren't just focused on going after a big buck do you think that was an advantage well i think i you know just growing up as a as a kid that's where i felt comfortable being in the outdoors um definitely the exposure i think over a longer period of time just kind of clues you into you know, different different ways that game utilizes terrain and, you know, just just hunting in general, you know, marksmanship, things like that, being comfortable around um, different types of guns and, you know, shooting bow and arrow at a younger age and stuff like that, you know, it all helped. But I will say that, you know, when I was growing up, it, it was fun. It was, it, was a, it was a traditional Wisconsin hunting camp. It was a friend of my dad's. Um, he had a 200-acre farm in Saxville, Wisconsin, which had a perfect mix of uh, uh, oak ridges and 
and pines, and, and it had some marshy swampland as well. So I, it was a really nice area to see a lot of different game. Um, right. But pri- primarily it was, at that time, it, it was more hanging out with my dad and my brother and his close friends, and, you know, we'd go out and set up uh, permanent tree stands that were in the same spots year to year. Uh, we'd hunt over bay piles. It was legal then. Um, you know, like, it just, it really... It was good exposure to seeing animals, but it wasn't anything like what I currently do now as far as, you know, or, you know, the knowledge that's available too. like going through the hunting base. It's just incredible that you have uh, people from all over the country that are, you know, willing to help each other and, and share tactics and information. I mean, you can really get way ahead of the curve as far as deer hunting goes just by you know, reading and then trying to apply those things to, to the areas that you hunt. Yeah, and I and I think that's a good point. I mean, a lot of us as we grew up sort of were in these traditional cycles of meeting up with family members or friends, hunting on a specific piece of property, hunting out of permanent stands that a lot of them, in my case, were nicknamed, right? You had a name for a certain stand that was in a certain spot on the property or even on public you know i've heard of guys having areas that were named a certain a certain area that particular members of the hunting party would always hunt or people would vie to try to get to that spot and uh it was sort of a sit and wait game right um there were there were legends of certain deer that came across their path but uh at least when I was younger, there wasn't a whole lot talked about hunting specific animals or using specific tactics to to get a certain animal. Um, how did that sort of transition from when you were younger begin to take shape for you? Well, back uh, when I first started hunting, I'm I'm currently 35 years old. Uh, the first time I went with my dad on the Sackville property, I think I was 10, um, and we sat in a, a bunch of straw straw um, bales in the middle of a, a pine plantation, and, you know, it was cold, and I remember that. But I didn't actually carry the weapon until at that time was 12, was the first year that I could carry a gun. And at, back in 1992, when I was 12, uh-huh. Um, shooting any buck at that time in that area was, you know, kind of well respected or, you know, like if you, if you got a buck during the gun season, everybody was super happy. Like, you know, every, even the adults were, they were trying to shoot even scrub bucks back then. So the, the mentality of hunting has really changed. Um, at that time, you know, there had been some bigger bucks shut off that property and uh, a couple of them still hang in that shack today you know, 130 bucks, maybe maybe pushing 140-inch 10-point or something like that. And I just remember as a kid, you know, just dreaming and dreaming of having the chance to, you know, even see one of those types of deer consistently or, you know, get lucky enough to shoot one. And I guess at first when I was in high school, like transitioning from that into high school, I just thought, you know, it was only a matter of time, hunting hunting the stands that were throughout the property, not, you know, paying attention to some some of the wind and stuff like that, but not anything like I do today or access. Um, it just kind of, uh, you know, I, I'd spent a lot of time. I'd, I'd go evenings and mornings as much as I could, just, just hoping that would happen, and it just, it really right. never eventually, did. Eventually, as, as it did with others, your time would come, the deer gods would bless you with a with a mature animal, and it would walk by, and you'd have your opportunity to to sort of take it, you know. Exactly, exactly. And we even got to the point that you know we started, you know, I think it was around '96 or something like that. You know, that's when the kind of the QDM you put up your QDM signs, and you you no longer were going to shoot uh, the one and a half year old bucks. You know, you're you're shooting for something with a at that time, 14 to 16 inch spread, probably a two and a half year old deer, and you know, and that would have been a really nice buck, and people would have been pretty proud at that time to, to shoot something like that, at least in our group. Right. Um, and we did, and we, you know, we started passing up those one and a half year olds, and 
And uh, the landowner and my dad ended up shooting some two- and three-year-old bucks in the next couple of years, but still nothing that I consistently, even though I was hunting just as hard as them, I I just never really had the opportunity to, to shoot one that that at that time was, you know, what I considered a head mount. Would you agree, though, that it's still, it's an important transition for people to make? I mean, everyone has different goals with this thing, right? And, and right. um like you mentioned earlier, and my family was the same way. A, a lot of hunting as I was a kid was camaraderie and enjoyment, but a big part of it was putting food on the table um, and sort of, and I think Dan has mentioned this too as well, that his family was very similar when he was growing up and then consciously making the decision to transition into, well, that, that one-year-old or one-and-a-half-year-old, two-year-old buck, I want to claim you know one of those. Now I want to challenge myself with, going after that three to four year old now five to six year old so you know I guess continue talking about how you sort of started making that transition into getting the wanting to get those older bucks sure sure um well all through high school I wanted one of those older bucks it just didn't really happen I had some opportunities I'd say at what, what now I realize were two year old bucks that I thought were even bigger back at, back in the day. Um, and then I kind of met my wife um, roughly when I was 16 or 17 years old, and she's a couple, like two years younger than me. And her uncle, actually another uh, friend of our family, he, he knew my dad as well, um, had just this crazy wall of, uh, you know, 120-inch, maybe up to 145-inch box. I'd say back in the day he had probably a dozen dozen plus, you know, hanging all over in a basement. And I was just in awe that anybody um, could put that many big deer down. And back in back in the early 90s, um, you know, a 120-inch deer was a, was a nice buck. You know, you didn't, you didn't see, at least I didn't see the quantities of, you know, the monster bucks that are shot now today. Right, right. I would agree. So I kind of... I kind of, you know, would pick his brain and try and listen to his stories and and, and just kind of try and figure out at that time how, how he was doing that consistently or, you know, at the time, in my opinion, I thought it was because he had special land or uh, mostly I thought it was just because of the locations that he's hunting, but I've learned over time that that doesn't always guarantee you success either. Was there a specific thing that you picked up from him that you remember that he sort of correlated to being able to get on all those bucks? I think it was between him and then uh, two of my college roommates that I started to realize that people that were consistent in killing these bigger bucks were hunting very, very long hours, and they were doing it later into the season, um, than most of the uh, rookie hunters. Like, you know, when I was younger, I would hunt, like Dan, almost every day, September through October. And by the time November rolled around, I was almost a little bit burnt out. Like, I just didn't realize, you know, how good that early part of November was for, for deer movement or buck movement in particular. Sure. Um, so that was, that was, you know, among the hundred different mistakes that I'd made as a younger hunter, that was, like burning yourself out too early was one of the big ones. And then what I, what I learned from, from my wife's uncle and two of my college roommates is just the amount of time they spent to shoot those bigger deer, which, which I think once I hit college, I started to really start to put the time in, you know, closer to November to uh, try and try and shoot bigger deer. Yeah, I can, I can relate to that because I had a couple friends in college, the Schluter brothers. They're twins, oh, I, actually. I know who they are. Yeah, yeah. I know who they are. <laughs> a lot of people know who they are. Well, those guys, they were a couple guys like you described. Where they they have two wall walls full of big deer, but I mean, I can remember uh, Ben spending, you know, thirty five hours <laughs> one week in stand you know he was like yeah i spent about 35 hours on stand this week and you know that sort of correlates with what you're saying that 
these guys are spending a lot of time on stand and and with other factors but that's a huge factor in in getting these deer during the right time of the year you know um and and doing it you know and now as i talk to them present day because they're you know they have families and and kids much like you and i you know they talk about how that experience of doing that has allowed them today to understand how to sort of pick and choose opportune times and weather conditions and such to, to slip in and hunt more efficiently, I guess. Exactly. Exactly. I agree 100%. Um, you know, that first, the, I kind of mentioned it in, in emails back and forth that we had before this discussion. The first truly big box that I killed um, was while I was in college. I think it was around 2000, 2001, something like that. And I think I hunted, you know, late October into November, almost almost 12 or 13 days straight. And I was spending a lot of time in the woods. And then even after hunting in the woods and, and you know, maybe missing some of the courses that I shouldn't have been missing in college, <laughs> um, I was I would shine at night, too. I mean, I was totally obsessed with, with trying to kill one of these big bucks. And it just, mentally, I, you know, I, I set it as a goal, and I wasn't going to quit until it happened. And when it happened, it, it just gave me such a sense of pride or, you know, such a rush that it finally happened. It, it almost became like, you hate to say it, but almost a mini addiction, you know, that I wanted to get back to that feeling again and again and again. Well, um, let's talk about that particular hunt a little bit for for that deer because obviously that was during a time in your life when you know you were in school you you arguably probably had more free time um, mm-hmm. than you do now with three kids and, and your wife and a full time job because it and talk about some of the tactics and we know time is one of them but some of the other sure. things you did to to get that particular buck and then we can sort of transition into how that's differed to what you do now. Sure. Um, I think with, with uh, the, the thing that really opened my eyes about living down south in Dane County, and, I, you know, if you read anything that I post on the Hunting Beast, um, you'll hear me pound location, 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 location. I spend more time looking for locations with big deer um, then I probably do scouting them in the woods. You know what sure. I mean? Like if you can, if you can get into a pocket uh, or an area that contains high numbers of big deer, your odds, you know, double, triple, quadruple um, compared to hunting an area that's only got a few of those animals. So I'm um, getting back to Madison. If anybody's ever been down in that neck of the woods, so you travel west of Madison and there's a uh, black earth, maze of uh, yep. Mount Hora, all that, all that beautiful rolling farmland to the west of Madison. Just hunted Mount Horeb yesterday. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So exactly. Um, and you know, it was such an eye opener to me. Um, again, two of these roommates kind of tipped me off. They were back. They were way ahead of their time as far as shed hunting too. These guys were nuts. They still are today. Um, as far as looking for cat antlers in the winter, and they kind of tipped me off. You know. You know, I was living with them, so I'd see, I'd see the antlers they'd bring back, and I was just, you know, in awe that they could be picking up these kinds of antlers within driving distance of where we were living on campus. Right. Um, so they kind of took me off to areas that were west of uh, Madison to kind of check out, and I started, you know, spotlighting more the next year. And I, I happened to lock in on this 10-point buck that I eventually killed. It took me, like I said, almost uh, 12 days, but I first... I first shined them, I think, probably sometime around, you know, late October, like the 24th, 25th, something like that. And he was just this big, big body, like nothing I'd ever seen before, uh, shining, you know, around those areas, just bigger deer than what I was used to seeing back home in central so, Wisconsin, bigger. So when you first shined him, what sort of information did did you immediately catalog in your mind? Obviously... You had general location, right? And right. what are yeah. some other things that you immediately recorded when you shine this buck? Uh, well, I just, you know, it was kind of a progression of things. The first time you shine them, you know, you're just, 
like I was seeing, you know, in that whole area, just kept driving around and it was seeing more than just him. There were other really nice bucks too, but that, that deer in particular, he was one of them that I just had recently put into the, you know, what, what do you consider a big, a heavy weighing buck dressed out? And I think he was somewhere in like 205, 210 dressed. He was sure. just a really, really, really long deer, you know, just, he looked, he just dwarfed the other deer that he was with, you know, so he was just kind of a, like he really caught your attention. If there were 10 deer in a field, you could tell instantly that he was a buck just because of right. his body. Um, as far as cataloging areas, um, that was kind of more, you know, like obviously he was out in alfalfa field or other agriculture, but I just kept shining him and shining him night after night in that same general vicinity. And there was some managed forest land in that area. Did you put together any sort of timeline from the time when you shined them to to correlate them back to bedding, or were you not kind of in that mindset at that point yet? Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't at, at this point in time, I wasn't, I wasn't there yet with bedding or even with, uh, you know, the leeward side, the ridges. That's what I ended up killing them on was uh, the leeward side of a, a ridge. Um, now that I, you know, think about it, but, um, like at that time I didn't understand any of that. Um, on this particular deer though, I did shine him two nights in a row into November, um, trailing a doe in the same valley. Okay. And unfortunately it was a little bit, um, to the east of the MFL land that, you know, that I could hunt and it was within a half mile and I actually shined them on the MFL land. And, uh, there was this huge long driveway leading up to this ridge top and I had no idea, you know, I just decided one day, middle of the day to drive up there and to ask her permission to hunt, you know, on that ridge line or, you know, the ridge that was above the valley that I'd seen him in the two nights prior. Right. And when I got up to the house, it was this huge, mansion built up on the side of the hill i would say it you know thinking back today it was probably over a million dollar house uh-huh. and i thought there i thought there was no way in in the world that this person was going to give me permission to hunt right you know right. on on the land but believe it or not the the wife came to the door and um she said she'd talk to the husband and get back to me and you know i kind of took that for yeah that that basically is kind of dead in the water but he did actually call me I think it was that day or the next day and tell me to come out and talk to him. And he kind of show me where I could go and stuff like that. And then I got, was this one of your first times asking for permission on private kind of outside your wheelhouse of where your family hunted or had you done it before? Right. No, this was the first time outside of, uh, you know, central Wisconsin where I knew somebody that knew somebody that, you know, worked with, so-and-so or something like that. I had some kind of connection to that person. Um, so how did you, know, you get was... yourself to the point just to go and, and do it? Because I think for a lot of guys, this is sort of a, it can be a blocker point, right? Because it's hard to go up right. and ask someone to, can I hunt on your property? And Right. I think I, I think it was just the size of the buck, <laughs> you know, yeah. that I, and the consistency of seeing him down in this valley. I knew he was up on that, likely up on that ridge top because I'd seen him there like two nights in a row. And I mean, he was, he was a boss buck. He was running around those all over out in this big alfalfa field. And, uh, you know, I just, I just figured, what, what do I have to lose? You know, I drive up there, you know, and I, and I've been rejected so many times. Like I've asked a lot of times since then. And, you know, people are leery to answer the door, you know, like people get, you know, sometimes it's not a real fun situation to be in, um, asking for permission, but, down down and around Madison, a lot of people own property that do not hunt, you right. know, and that's that's kind of a, you know, I mean, it's more of a liberal area or what, what have, whatever you want to say, um, but they, they're open to the idea of hunting if it's being done for the right reasons or being done in a respectful manner, and I explained to them that, you know, I was a student at, at Wisconsin and you know, my family farm was a couple hours away, and this, you know, this this property was 30, 35 minutes from from where I was living currently. And you know, I'd really appreciate the opportunity just to come out, you know, for a couple weekends and and try and and bull hunt, you know. And they they'd actually seen the buck, 
the, the oh, husband sure. had seen this same 10 pointer. He told me after we got to the discussion and he showed me the property lines that they'd seen him cross their driveway like a couple times in the last week. So you can only imagine how excited I was to get in there. Um, I think it was November 6th and uh, had an opportunity to hunt that deer. And I think I killed him on the very first time I was there. Um, and it ended up being the leeward side of a ridge with uh, the wind coming over the top, just, just like ex- explained in the videos. And uh, it was just a beautiful, beautiful chunk of property. It was really thick with underbrush, uh, just heavy, heavily carved out trails on that ridge side. You know, I'm guessing there was, just wasn't a lot of hunting pressure in that in that vicinity at that time. So did the owner and, uh, of the property, did he actually hunt or no? He was just observing. He, he did not He did not hunt, but he, he had a friend that did hunt there um, during the rifle season. Um, so, you know, I... I got the permission and ended up shooting. I think it was it was a cold November November morning, like November sixth, and I had on rubber boots. And by I think by about nine thirty, ten o'clock, my feet were numb. Um, but <laughs> but just luck would have it. Um, he actually was still with that same doe that I'd shined him with. I'm almost positive the night before, and she jumped the fence from the neighboring land and came came right down the trail with him following. It was just crazy. It all came together, and, you know, that first big deer that you shoot after trying to get one, like, you know, you make it a point to, to try and hunt a big deer. That very first one you get, they're, they're, I can't, you can't even explain the feeling right. that you get from get from that situation. So, um, so that, actually, one of, the, one of the forum members, uh, uh, Dave Kraft, he's another... Uh, UW uh, graduate. Actually, he was one of the guys that helped me uh, drag that drag that one out of the bottom. Nice. Of course, he went he went downhill after he died. So, um, yeah. we drag we drug him to the top of the ridge, and then the landowner brought his small tractor and actually loaded him up in the bucket and took it right to the. I had a car at that time. <laughs> took it right to the car. It was just a it was a crazy situation. Yeah. Crazy situation. So. But that's kind of where it all started. From there is when, you know, that, that, that adrenaline rush, that, that feeling of accomplishment is kind of what, what sparked my uh, drive to try and, you know, go after bigger and better deer. Well, and I think what's important with, from that story is that, you know, we're, we're advertised to a lot now in the hunting industry. And I think younger guys getting into it, they're... They're advertised a lot, too, with a lot of products, a lot of sort of gimmicky things, things that, you know, a lot of companies claim you need to have in order to be successful out in the woods, or they're going to they're gonna put this big buck in front of you. And, right. and what, I, what, what I like about that story is that what it boiled down to is you getting out in your car and, and you getting out into different areas, shining, and... You, that's you pattern that buck. I mean, you pattern him to the point where you said, okay, if I'm gonna actually go in and take him, I need to figure out how to get access to this private land. And you went in and asked permission, and it turned out well, and you got permission. Um, but if you would have never went out and shined, you would have never right. even known that buck was there. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And it just—I think that's a big, you know, like. I I said it I just said it previously too, like that location piece. You know, it takes either word of mouth, shining, uh trail cam data or something something just to get you into the vicinity where there's you know, the deer that you're looking for and once once you get in the vicinity then it's a matter of, you know, looking for certain things which we can touch on later in this discussion if you'd like. Some of the things that I now look for after, you know, after doing this for 15 years, like there's a a definite recipe that, that I can cook up that usually will show an area that has a mature deer. Yeah. Um, Or mature deer to hunt. Um, We can talk. Yeah. If you want to transition into that, uh, we can right now. Sure. Um, So I guess, and I've I've mentioned this too, and I think I even started a thread once on the hunting beast as the, you know, what What do other successful guys look for? And I think uh, Eric Pizar, known as Spy, Spy Spar, 
uh, pipe in it as well as a few others. But but if you're looking for an area that, that contains higher numbers of big deer, you need to find um, properties that have obstacles. And water is a good one. Um, thick cover, swamps, marsh grass is good, or bluff-like um, topography that, you know, people just are not going to climb up and down. Uh, you ever been over to western Wisconsin? You know, somebody, I've, I've taken my dad and, and my father-in-law into the bluffs of Baraboo, and they just, they can't do it. You know, up right. and down those huge, those huge ridges, one day of doing that, and they're done. They, they don't want to go back the next day. And then when you kill an animal, you know, that's, that's another um, difficult process to extract them out of that. Uh, so those are a few things. Um, rural areas, you know, you don't you don't want to have anything that that has a huge city nearby. I mean, that that definitely makes things more difficult as far as the pressure goes. Um, if you if you can find an area that has bigger chunks or bigger blocks of privately owned land, um, if you ever look at a a uh, plot map of uh, western Wisconsin or some of the, you know, Sauk County, Dane County, some of those western areas of uh, Madison, you'll notice that the farm sizes down there are, a lot of them are really big. I mean, I'm talking like people own five, six 600,000 acres, 2,000 acres. Um, if you find a jackpot, you could find somebody that maybe owns two, 3,000 private acres. And then if you can hunt off of that, you're almost assuring yourself that you're in, a, in an area that likely has um, some deer with age on them just because, you know, they're probably going to leave that big chunk of land that they're exclusive to their family, but what do they have, eight, eight ten family members maybe hunting, you know, three, 4,000 acres? Right. That's going to leave a lot of those deer getting into the next year. Um, so those are, those are some of the things. Um, you know, I also mentioned... In our email, and I think this is something that you and Dan might have keyed in on that property that you're hunting, is some kind of restrictive hunt, um, be it a, a draw hunt or something like that, a bull-only hunt, which, you know, I've kind of looked into. Luckily, when I was down in Madison, that's right around the time that uh, Dane County opened up park hunting, and it was bull-only, and it, it was special permit-only, and I... I blew it on a monster buck out in Nasomania in one of those parks. I mean, it was probably, looking back, probably 155, 160-inch deer that I had at 15 yards, and I didn't kill him. But, I mean, just that's what I was looking for. I was looking for restricted, you know, um, access. Although it was public, you you just had to apply for it. You know, you had to write in or do something ahead of time or, or do a proficiency test with a bow and arrow to be able to hunt that area. So um, when so you're... Those are, when you're looking for these areas now, um, mm-hmm. I mean, are you starting, do you do searches? Obviously, in the state of Wisconsin, you probably got, you've built sort of a backlog of what you look for, but um, right. do you start online looking at maps and areas that intrigue you, and then from there start getting out and actually driving to these areas and, and looking at them on foot and then shining kind of what's your progression as you work through your process of elimination, I guess? Yeah, a lot of it, I think a lot of it nowadays starts on the Internet. Um, and even maybe even cluing in on, you know, you hate to say it, but some, you know, like the Schluter brothers or someone like that, just trying to figure out where, where are these guys hunting that they can kill all these big animals, you know? And that might not get you um, next to the farm that they're hunting, but it'll get you in the general vicinity, um, and then from right. there, you can work, up, work off of that and, and do some shining, um, you know, talk to some people, what have you, to, to kind of narrow it down. And then finally, you know, uh, getting boots on the ground. One example I guess I can give is uh, the Missouri situation. That was back in uh, 2010. And at that, you know, I was just at that stage where it was it was time to try and uh, do something out of state and do it on my, my own. I had already gone to Manitoba and on that hunt we had to have, you know, a guide um, in order to obtain those tags to hunt in Manitoba, but he pretty much gave us three wheel of, you know, where we could hunt and set stands and stuff like that, so it wasn't 100% guided, but definitely had some, you know, um, help on where to start and stuff like that. But the Missouri thing was kind of just right out of the box, like, you know, heading down to Missouri, 
you hear a lot about Northeast Missouri, big buck, you know, potential, borders Iowa, you know, just so we decided to look at some maps, um, look for some of those things that I just discussed, you know, be it hills, be it be it water, marshy areas, um, maybe even there's some restricted access areas. I don't want to get into too much detail because you probably figure out where, I'm, where I go down there, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, anyway, you know, so that's where we started, and then right. uh, we had a group, we had a group of four guys that kind of we went down there, stayed in a hotel, um, and just started picking apart these properties, looking for, um, you know, that classic big buck sign or just you know general deer sign uh, to try this first hunt. And then we had we decided to make things easier. We'd go in groups of two because when you're trying to hunt with four guys, it you know just if you're trying to hunt the same area, kind of yeah, never tough. worked. It never worked out well, and that's another topic to discuss. Like a lot of times now, I'm hunting by myself um, on all the you know most of my best properties. I kind of have have it you know the private properties that I hunt. I, I have it sole access at least for bull hunting, and you know that's just the way it has to be if you're going to try and keep keep things fresh. But this group of two guys went down earlier and they hunted the public and they saw some deer and there was a lot of pressure from out of staters. Um, but they had mentioned to me that, you know, there are these huge expansive CRP fields and they were seeing the bigger deer out in the grass. Um, and then, you know, there's this one particular area they were seeing them migrate out of the grass north into the private property. And that again led me, um, to try and get access into that private property, and I, I ended up working out a deal with the landowner to hunt that, and it was a it was a river bottom, and um, I, you know, opening day, my buddy was still on public, and he shot a nice, probably 125, 130-inch 11 pointer on public, and he, he missed the even bigger buck on the public, and he was trying to talk me into coming off of this private, but I had deer all over, and they were running along this river, and eventually right. I ended up pulling that biggest buck of my life, but getting back to it, like, how did I end up in that in that spot? You know, it had those ingredients. It had uh, a monster chunk of public land. It had uh, Terry Drury's farm, you know, after research was, by flat book, was two miles away from where I was hunting as sure. a crow flies. So, I mean, you, you're in an area with Terry Drury and all the surrounding private landowners. You know that them guys are, you know, letting those 130, 140-inch deer live. So that just puts you, you know, it increases your odds at the chance for a really big one. And I kind of look for that in Wisconsin, too. There's certain areas in Wisconsin that, you know, there's more management. Um, if you ever hunted over in the western part of the state, those guys don't give a second look to 130-inch deer over there. They really do not. It is not a big deer to them. Um, you know, we had a, had a get-together in the local town that I stayed out there two years ago with the locals, and almost every one of them brought over a 170-inch plus gross deer. They all had killed one. Um, and wow. that's simply from being in that area and hunting, you know, for any amount of time. It was just unbelievable the racks that these guys were bringing into this this little social gathering. I was just shocked. Um, so now I'm spending more time over in western Wisconsin, although it's very hard for me to get there, you know, being three and a half, four hours away. So, right. Right, and that becomes a challenge as well. Right. So once you've uh, kind of isolated one of these properties, obviously, um, you know, it's clear that you work look for these certain pieces of top topography. You like big chunks of public land adjacent to private marshes, tamarack, large, thick areas. Um, you're looking for specific areas that have you know, quality that you know have quality deer in the area, either by hearsay or by who owns the property. Um, so once you actually get access to one of these areas, what do you do when you get on foot? Um, I spend a lot of time, uh, a lot of time on, uh, on maps for both aerial and uh, topo maps. Um, you know, and, and there's a lot of guys that can explain a lot of those uh, structures way better than I can. Um, I will add that, you know, after I killed that big one uh, west of Madison, I started hunting more up in Sauk County in, in the ridge tops, and that's about the time that I stumbled. I think I killed maybe two more nice bucks, and then I stumbled across uh, Dan's Hill Country 
video, and that's when I really started to peg down, um, you know, how the deer in those hillsides were using the wind. Because I at that, I could find the sign, and you know, I was hunting deep in the timber, but I just didn't understand. Once you start to realize how a buck uses his nose to scent for does and, and scent for uh, uh, protection, that's when you can really start putting yourself in positions to uh, to kill those animals. Right. Um, but, but as far as finding the specific spots, uh, you know, if I'm if I'm hunting a public chunk, I'm looking for something. And Dan talks about it all the time. Something that's overlooked. Um, sometimes those those areas can be close to the road, but oftentimes they're the the nastiest, hardest hardest parts in the area to get to. Whether they're a long walk or they're uh, they're crossing water. Um, I hate cattails. I avoid them uh, at all costs if I can. But I know I know you guys tread through cattails. Yeah. Um, you know if you can if you can do something like that, you you'll separate yourself from ninety ninety five percent of the pack. Um, and then you're hunting an area that, you know, is, is almost kind of like a little piece of private within that public. You know, it only takes an area of 40 acres within, say, a 1,000-acre chunk. Like you, you know, and, and those deer will be isolated in that one 40-acre, 80-acre pocket right. just because it's, there's no pressure there. Um, and that's kind of what I'm looking for. And then, you know, some kind of topography, like... I I can honestly say I don't think I, other than Chubbs, and we'll talk about him a little bit, that's the buck that I killed this year on my private lease, I can't ever say that I specifically set up, like, over the bed of a buck that I wanted to kill. Right. Um, I've, I've been in nasty, thick bedding areas, but I, I don't think I've ever, like, narrowed it down to a single bed like maybe some of you guys do that are hunting more um, marshes down in, you know, southeast Wisconsin where the pressure is extremely high you probably got to get right in on that, you know, single bed on an island or something like that to have an opportunity. But Is there a um, so, – go ahead. I was just going to say back to, uh, you know, breaking it down. So, you know, I definitely take a quick – well, some days a multiple-day stop if it's, if it's a big enough property, you know, hiking through hills or, or uh, in the winters, you know, that's when I like to go in the marshes when things are froze and you can really cover some ground. Um, after after you kind of do that initial trap, at least what I've learned over the years is, you know, we're probably going to talk about it a little bit is you know how to how to utilize trail cameras, and basically uh, I learned what I do now from one of my friends. I watched him kill a, uh, I think it ended up being a 180 inch deer, uh-huh. and he pegged that he pegged that thing down in a marsh using cameras and I mean he was super aggressive like everything you read about like you know blowing a deer out and they're gone forever and blah 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 I don't believe that as much anymore um seeing what I've seen with mature bucks and how aggressive you can be um and how far they move after you you know you can you can definitely bump them out of a a bedding area that they want to be in and they won't come back to it but they don't move I don't think as far as people think right um so he, he just kept rotating these cameras around, cameras around, and he was getting close. And same thing, he put an arrow in this gear, and it was a, a high shot, back shot. And we actually had a picture of it then, with a, unfortunately, with an arrow in the, in the back strap. Um, but, you know, it wasn't a week later, and he was right back in the wheelhouse of this particular deer, and he finally killed him. So it was wow. pretty, it's pretty amazing to watch. And at first I thought, well, you know, that's one isolated incident. And then he did it again and uh, on another mature deer, and then I started really paying attention to what he was doing. Um, and essentially I think, uh, I don't know what his name, what his real name is, but Moon Dude, Moon uh, Dune Dude out in Maryland kind of yep. mentioned the same thing. Like you cast this initial spread of cameras, as many as you got, and you just kind of plunk them all over through a property and you just – you're just essentially trying to get lucky and, and catch one of these um, deer on camera initially in the summer to begin with. And now that, you know, uh, minerals and stuff are illegal in Wisconsin, I focus on uh, apple trees are a big one. Um, isolated water sources are a big one. Um, any kind of structure within um, the timber or any kind of structure within the marsh, be it a fence line, 
um, or a creek or a transition from, uh, you know, an island to red brush or something like that, those transitions we talk about edge all the time. And that's where we'll initially plunk these cameras when we're, we're, we're trying to learn. And it, you might not be able to use that information the very first year that you do this. Right. But over time, over time, you pin down um, mature deer. Like, you can isolate them, figure out where they like to be at what time of the year, and they, they tend to show up routinely if they're still alive in the same areas, which is just mind-boggling um, to think that, you know, that you can use cameras in that way, but it, it, it does work. So how has this, do you think, has changed? Because it's an interesting topic, obviously, um, using cameras, getting these deer on camera. I know a lot of guys that put out cameras, and um, I, I don't have experience seeing someone other than guys that have talked about it on The Beast of actually utilizing a camera to pinpoint a deer, narrow it, narrowing it down, narrowing it down, narrowing it down to get inside that deer's you know, home Corner. zone where they can actually slide in and kill it. I know a lot of guys that get mature white tails on camera, and every year they show me dozens of pictures of these deer. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of times they never end up shooting them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what's, uh, you know, as you observed your friend doing this, what are some of the, I guess, more subtle things that he does or doesn't do with the camera as he's moving them around and kind of narrowing closer to this buck? What I think maybe we do more, and I know Moon does this as well, is uh, we spend a lot of time. People don't realize how much time I spend in the winter um, walking around uh, looking for shed antlers, and not only shed antlers, but looking for a bedding sign, you know, back in. So, so I'll just run you through a transition of what I would typically do, like, say, on a farmland property or creek. You know, we can talk about a creek property that I often hunt down in uh, Salt County. Um, I, I have the cameras out on the outside edges, agricultural fields in the summers, you know, just trying to locate. And that doesn't always mean that those deer are even going to be there, but that does typically mean if you get them on camera, they're somewhere in a section. Um, there are deer that will move very long distances from summer to fall patterns, but a lot of times they stay within, you know, a 600-acre block. They're somewhere in that area. Um, and then you'll get you'll get deer, some deer, that just end up residing there. You know, you're getting summer pictures of them, and they, they stay into the fall. Um, so most of my cameras in the beginning are set up, you know, on non-intrusive outside spots, and they're peppered all over. Um, the example of this property down in Sauk County, I had one on, uh, you know, I love uh, corn to timber uh, gaps. Deer love to travel those, so those, those are great areas. And a lot of times you're you're not, maybe during a rut you might hunt there, but or early season, but a lot of times, you know, going into that area is really not going to booger up anything that you're trying to uh, to kill back in, you know, in thicker cover or closer to the bedding areas. Right. So that's one spot, um, you know, like a drainage, a creek drainage or something like that, or a creek crossing, one that you're not going to hunt. Um, you know, obviously, creek crossings that are back in the timber and thick cover, you want to save those for hunting. But um, some of those that, you know, maybe open inside corners or something like that, that's in an area where you just know it's not going to, a big buck's not going to walk, you know, in that open area during the daylight. So, but he will in the evenings you know, um, and you can put your cameras in those locations, uh, inside corners, sometimes that you know you're not going to hunt, that's another spot, just just various locations like this, and, you, you know, essentially you're just trying to gather information on what's in the area. Um, so, so, yeah, you, you sort of stay out of those hot zones to start with, with yep. several cameras, because you're yep. really just trying to gain a catalog of, of right. what's on the property. Right. So then now I'm hunting, say I'm hunting five different properties, you know, that have a deer that I want to kill on them. But typically that gets narrowed down to one or two deer. I mean, you know, you just you just think that maybe through last year's observations or, or encounters or one just gets under your skin, that's the deer you're going to hunt. Well, then maybe on those other properties you can 
start to transition off the summer food into the, you know, the fall movement patterns, you can maybe put them in more obtrusive areas the first year just because you're essentially trying to learn things that you might use. And I think Stan has mentioned this and some other hunters have mentioned this that use trail cameras. Is that, oh, I know Joe has from Iowa, is that they're, uh, they're trying to gain intel for the next year. Um, and that doesn't mean that I don't still use cameras, you know, when I'm trying to move in on a buck, but I'm, I'm, I think people get tripped up a little bit on thinking that you can just put them anywhere and it's not problematic. Every time that you go in and check them and, and move them around, you're leaving those sand trails all over and, you know, it, it can become problematic. But at the same time, if you're hunting a specific deer and, you know, you're using cameras like, say, on a scrape on the way to your tree stand that you can check on the way back out, you know, you're going to be leaving that scent trail anyway, and then why not dump it off and gather intel while you're not there? Um, right. But I'm also I'm also using them a lot on properties that I don't plan to hunt that year, and I'm sticking them in spots that you probably want to put trail cameras, tight funnels, uh, thick creek crossings, you know, uh, a saddle in a ridge top, you know, that's just a dynamite-looking spot on the top of um, But, you know, I'm putting them there, and then I'm, I'm kind of seeing what happened what happened that year, and I'm cataloging all these pictures. And eventually, over time, um, the chubs, I wish I could show all the pictures of that deer, but you can eventually, over time, isolate specific trails that they use within um, those terrain features, and they use them year to year. The same, the bucks use the same trails. Um, the heavy doe trails stay heavy doe trails. And i would mentioned this before, like when you're hunting in hilly terrain, Bucks don't often use those beat-down trails that you find or even find, you know, rubs on trails. They're using the topography to wind-check those trails. Um, and by that I mean we talk about the, ther- or the thermal tunnel and the one-third elevation. Like the heavy, you know, cruising trail that you see there is more, you know, like the, the bucks don't often don't come trotting right down that thick trail. It's, it's somewhere above that or off to the side of that, and they're almost like they're centricking those heavily used trails, and they're using right. the topography. Go ahead. Sorry, Mark. No, that's all right. Yeah, it makes sense. They're they're getting themselves in close proximity to where that main travel corridor is so they can check it either by sight or by smell. Um, right. And that is, a, I guess I never thought about that, but that is a that is an interesting, I guess, use of all this camera history and, and travel history is that you actually get to understand a difference between a beat down trail that every deer is using on the property versus a trail that mm-hmm. only a mature animal is using. Right. And then you start to see trends too as to how, you know, we always talk about in the marsh on the backside of a, a dogwood or red brush or something like that, how you always see this beat down cruising trail. And those are in fact, Buck cruising trails on the downwind side of thick cover. You know, like you're running cameras there, you'll get all kinds of bucks that cruise um, down that trail. Um, you know, so that's just one example. Say a, a parallel trail to a creek too. I love hunting creeks during the rut because these bucks, you know, they'll they'll jump on a creek and they'll just cruise along that creek. You know, checking all the little oxbows and blowdowns and areas along that creek for bedded does. It's almost like a super highway if you can find a creek bottom that runs through uh, hilly terrain or through timber, you know, in an area, say, South County, something like that, that has, you know, some bigger deer. Like, I, you know, I run cameras down there, and I get um, get deer on it through the summer, and there's, you know, some good deer in the area, but they're in the rut. It's just crazy to see what shows up. Like, And I think what happens is these deer get on those creek bottoms, and they just cruise them, you know, and they're looking for – because they know that those are going to be – you know, in, a lot of times in close vicinity to that water and that cover. Right. Um, right. So, so that's definitely definitely one of the spots I really like to key in on during the rut, just because I think deer almost use them, bucks especially use them like super highways. When I'm when I'm not hunting a particular deer, just hunting an area, you know, hoping for rut hunting, as a lot of people would call it, I guess. Right. In general, yeah, yeah so, makes sense. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, back to the cameras, you know, so cataloging these pictures, I have a computer at home, 
each uh, deer gets its own file folder. Some of them um, get a name after a while. I know some people hate that, but when you're talking about all these different deer with somebody, after a while you got to start naming them somehow, otherwise nobody knows what you're talking about. Yeah, keeping track of them, right. Right. Um, and then, you know, just cataloging things over the years. And, and, and deer change, um, where they are as a two-year-old often is not where they are when they're four. But once they hit that four, four, five, six stage, a lot of times they're starting to really hone in on where they like to be or their core area. At least that's what I've found. And uh, a lot of that's found by, you know, continually moving cameras around or just using my scouting um, along with the cameras to kind of, okay, I'm getting him on camera here. I'm, you know, his direction of travel is this way. He's doing it at this time of the day. Like, where is a likely bedding area, you know, related to that to that camera situation? What, um, and obviously you're using these as a very precise tool to sort of, fuel your goals of getting on particular deer, mature deer. Um, what are your thoughts on sort of the, because this came up in in the trail camera thread that was on the hunting beast, just about the use of cameras and, and how much impact they've had on not only taking big bucks, but sort of that motivating factor. Like would a guy spend as much time in the woods if he wasn't <laughs> seeing deer, you know, it's almost like that, right. that carrot that's out there. I've got these right. five mature bucks on camera. Now I'm out there longer because I believe I have a chance to get one of these. Right. I mean, and that, that you nailed it right on the head. Like if, if I didn't have pictures of some of the deer that I had in that area, there is no way I could sit dark to dark you know, in big timber or what have you. And one of my buddies actually, we, we had one on camera back in, I think, in like 2011, 2012. And there were some other hunting beast members hunting in the same vicinity, too. It was a public land buck. He probably grows 200 inches. And we'd seen him shining, and we had all these pictures of him. Um, one of my buddies hunted that deer, I think, like 15 all-day sits. It was just crazy. Wow. Like he went all in after this deer, and, he, and we never got him, and we don't, we don't even know what happened to him. But, uh, um, you know, there is no way that you would have that kind of drive and determination unless you were constantly getting pictures of that deer in that general vicinity. And we did. He actually ended up seeing him one time, um, but, uh, you know, we don't know what happened to him. And I often wonder what happens to these massive monster bucks that sometimes you catch on trail cameras, you know, over and over and over again, and then they disappear, what happened? You know, it's just a, it's a mystery, but it, it keeps you coming back for more, I guess. Yeah, it, it is sort of interesting when you think back, you know, 25 years, and there, you know, there was people that were using sort of primitive forms of setting up Polaroids and, and trail, trail cameras in that manner, but nowhere near to the level that it is today. Um, I also think it's interesting that, and Dan explained this to me once of, you know, using a trail camera, even on a smaller piece of property, how many times would you actually have to sit to hunt all your best spots on that property? You can sort of hunt those setups for X amount of time that you want to run the camera from morning until night. Like you said, where your friend spent uh, 15 full day hunts. Right. If you're running multiple cameras in a bunch of different areas where a buck like that exists, it's almost you can do those 15 hunts without actually being in the woods until you decide you want to go out there, <laughs> you know? Right, right. It's I mean, an interesting okay, dynamic. Remember, yeah, you got to remember, though, the trail camera only helps you um, determine whether or not the deer is there. I mean, a lot of these deer I kill, I'm still putting in. I mean, I'm getting more, I'd say I'm getting more efficient at uh, picking the right times, you know, based on weather patterns, uh, you know, what what I see in trail cameras, like, that's the other thing you learn over time. Um, you know, how to look at these pictures and what these pictures are actually telling you. 
um, you know, somebody that doesn't run a lot, of, or if you only have one trail cam in an area, it doesn't nearly tell you as much information as the four that you could have if you could afford it, you know. Um, the four cameras and how that deer is particularly moving, you know, from one location to the next if you're lucky enough to catch them in two spots throughout the evening uh, or night hours. You know, it's almost like they sometimes they, they get into like a circuit, and I've talked about this before too, um, during the rut or even earlier on in the season, um, they, they almost become patternable in the circuit that they do from bed to food source, transitioning to another food source, circling back to bed. And then again, during the rut, um, you know, you'll see deer that'll, that'll circle through an area every couple of days. Like, boom, you'll get them. It's almost like clockwork. Like every two or three days, they come racing across the ridge top or, uh, on that back end of a red brush, you know, transition in the marsh, every couple of days you get this buck coming through on daylight during the run. Right. Um, in that vicinity. And it, after a while, um, you can really start to know, you almost predict where they're going to show up and when. Um, and it's, it's unbelievable that it happens, you know, it, it's replicatable year to year. It, that that's, a, that's kind of the eye-opening thing that, that I've learned over doing this for, you know, 10 years plus now of running piles of trail cameras. And it's not just me. I don't, I don't have, I mean, I have 10 or 12 myself, but, you know, I have 10 or 12. My buddy has 15. My other buddy has 15. And we're kind of all, you know, sharing information, sharing pictures, sharing um, ideas of how we're setting up on the particular deer based on the information that we have and bouncing ideas off of each other and, you know, how we're using the wind or access um, to our advantage to get into those locations. Yeah, and, and, and of, a lot of what I'm hearing is, too, I mean, obviously the, the camera is going to get you a picture of a particular buck or bucks that are in an area, but it's really, when you start talking about patterning their movements and understanding the location of the buck as it relates to different topography on that piece of property, yeah. I guess, you know, studying those things allows you to make it repeatable year after year in different areas. Uh, Correct. Right. Yeah. You know, and it, so it's one thing to get a picture of a nice buck, but it's another thing to understand why that buck showed up in that spot at that particular time under those particular weather conditions. Um, in that particular piece of property due to, you know, how the topography was in that area or maybe other pressures, you know, hunting sure. pressure externally and things like that. Yeah, and food sources too. I mean, all these, you know, after after doing it for a decade with all these different cameras, like, like you just said, you know, you use, essentially you get to test your theories of where deer will be and why and when, you know, by using trail cameras and they just, you get better and better at it over time, and then, you know, you can kind of evolve from, you know, how you're using them maybe in the beginning to, you know, when you get further down the road. You know, knowing, like you mentioned in the email, too, are there pitfalls of using them? Well, of course there are. I mean, you're you're walking into areas that you're potentially going to be hunting and you're laying down scent trails, and I can tell you, um, you know, going back to the gimmicks and the scent thing, and I don't want to get into all that because everybody gets all excited about it on, on the Internet. But, uh, you know, when I was young, younger, I bought into all that stuff. I, I dressed outside. I wore uh, carbon sprays, carbon suits. I uh, gelled my body with, with certain products, you know, trying to kill the bacteria on my skin. And then as I evolved or, you know, learned from other hunters or what have you, just... Just my own observation, Dan was a big proponent of that, too. It's just after a while, you learn how to use um, the topography or, you know, the structure of the land to get you where you need to be and where those best spots, you know, like you, you can show me a map and, yeah, we can both pick out a, a, a awesome funnel that's in the middle of the timber, but how are you going to get to it, you know? Right. Um, so then you start to look at, you know, um, these topography features along with access. And the access becomes very important, too, to some of my best spots. Like, year in and year out, the spots that produce are the spots that have um, a particular access. Or, 
or you got to do what kind of what Dan and some of these other guys do. You got to hunt sparingly in those locations. You can either move around a lot and burn a spot by, you know, taking that that blazing a trail. I understand that not every everything is going to have beautiful access to get to. So sometimes you got to burn a bridge and and go into a spot and it's just it's one and done. You hunt it and it's junk, right. essentially because you left this huge scent trail going into that area and then deer. If they, you know, if they don't smell you in a tree, they're going to smell you in the next 48 hours when they're, you know, doing their thing in the dark. And that's what I think a lot of people don't understand is, is where you walk in the day will be discovered in the dark. If not that night, the next night after, or the next night after that, that scent lingers for days a lot of time. Right. So, obviously, when you're accessing particular areas, what are some things that you're you're factoring in? I mean, the current wind. It probably is a big factor. Um, what are some other things that you're you're looking at? I think Stan talked about this in his podcast, but you know, using some sort of water is is good. You know, you don't leave that scent trail. So that creek bottom, particular creek bottom that I've I've shot a buck or two down down in sock, I'll actually walk in the water, okay. or I'll walk on the opposite side of the oxbow that I want to hunt, and then use a, a fallen tree or something like that to cross the creek and then set up right as I cross the creek. So that, that scent profile on the ground is just not there for any deer that's cruising, you know, on the inside of that oxbow, you know, when he comes cruising through that area. So I'm checking. In the hills, um, you know, I'll, I'll burn up some logging roads for access. I'll, I'll come up a, a thick uh, rocky drainage is another one. Um, sometimes, like in the hills, another kind of a cool spot to look for is if you have an open top, say, like an agricultural field on top, and then there's a drainage that comes up and pinches with that open top. So you're hunting the top of the drainage, but you can walk across this wide open field to get to it. And then any deer that's in the timber cruising during a rut is obviously going to want to stay in the timber, the bucks anyway. Right. And they'll, they'll, they'll cruise over the top of that drainage, and really they haven't had an opportunity, you know, to, to get your trail because you walk across a wide open space where they're not going to go and expose themselves. So that's, you know, just thinking about um, different types of access like that. You find a great spot. How do you get to it without alerting deer? I mean, you know, if you think about it, if you walk into your tree stand set and you burn up 180 degrees of movement to that stand by leaving a central, you just you just cut your odds in half. Yeah. Um, you know, so we talk about, you know, for others that maybe have not read on it that are listening to this, if you want to go back and read that uh, parallel trail um, discussion on the hunting beast, that those are really good access to, um, you know, you come in across the field or something like that and set up and hunting that parallel trail. Because essentially, if you're coming across an opening or down a fence line or something like that, you're not, you're leaving like 270 plus degrees of movement um, without your scent trail, you know. So it's, it's things to think about. Little things like that make big differences on doing it year in and year out. And I think a lot of people, um, I don't want to say they don't understand that, but it's just something that, you know, over when you're younger or whatever, you might not think about as much as you do after you've been trying to, you know, kill bigger deer for the better part of a decade. Yeah, I've seen that play, play into it while on stand, where if you miscalculate the direction that the deer are going to be coming from and they get across your trail before they they get into your kill area then it's it's game over yeah a lot of times it's the gig up but that's how you learn you know and you know, i'm not saying that you're going to come out there and you're just going to understand this all in one you know you, just, you can't just read it either on the hunting beast and then go apply it and start killing 140 inch deer unfortunately it just really does not work that way um, it takes it takes years of being in the woods and and reading sign and, you know, and, and per, getting getting to a point where you, um, you know, have a a routine for your setups or whatever, however you're doing things, you know, just it builds and builds and builds over time. And eventually, you know, you just start to get a gut feeling when you walk into an area where you need to be and, and how you need to get there. Yeah, I agree. That definitely takes, that definitely takes time and time on stand. Uh, it's, you know, there is, and, and about what we talked about earlier when we were kids, the the amount of information that was publicly available on how to hunt and how to hunt a specific way was fairly limited. A lot of it was because 
you, you know, you didn't have the internet. There wasn't a lot of written material out there either um, to, yeah. to read and sort of study. People just, they weren't talking about it. You know, you you set up on your family farm. Other people went out in public. They had an uncle, like you said, or a friend that was particularly efficient at killing certain bucks. And they did a couple things this way. And that's how information was passed. Um, right. I think people, obviously, through this forum, like, the hunting beast and through these podcasts can gain a lot of information, but what they need to realize is, is not to get it discouraged. Like you say, you, you may put these things into practice, but you're going to fail more times, (laughs) but you're going to learn a lot from that. Um, like you said, and then it's going to come together for you. But, um, you know, there's a lot of information out there, but you, you still got to get on stand and and do the do the groundwork to actually experience it and, and i would yeah, agree I that's where i see with some of you guys that are very successful year in year out you get into an area and it's like you just know you know that these tendencies are all in place therefore i'm very confident that i'm going to get on a mature animal you know right right yeah you get you get a almost like a Six sense of, you know, like, this is a really bucky stand or this is, you know, I've had stands too, like when we went to that, uh, we won that outfitting trip in Illinois and I was down there with Eric, you know, there's a few stands that I was in that I just felt like, oh boy, I'm, I'm in a hot spot today, you know, like in a, in a big, it was a bunch of hilly land down in Illinois that we hunted, right. but there were a few sets that I got in that I was like, this is junk, you know, I don't, I do not want to be here, you know, and that's, <laughs> kind of where I got to sit, you know, and maybe, maybe I was wrong. Maybe that, you know, those guys hunted there and they, they understand and stood at those spots, but you got to have, it kind of comes down to, you got to have confidence where you're setting up too. Otherwise you're just not gonna, you're not going to pay attention and you're not going to take things, you know, you just get sloppy. And when you get sloppy, your, your results drop off a cliff. And it's yeah. happened to, it's happened to me, you know, there'll be times that I just, you know, I don't focus as much. I get sloppy, and in the my deer sighting, it just plummet. You know, and those everything just plummets. And you're like, well, that's because I'm getting sloppy on how I'm setting up my access, like what I'm doing. Um, so it's, it it takes work. Now you talked about that in your email too. That somewhat being a pharmacist and your your OCD tendencies sort of helps you with your tree stand setup and your equipment and and how you go about setting up on your spots is right. that I, you, you I don't kind know. of I gave the impression you don't leave anything to chance <laughs> right right i uh you know just i think as a as our profession you know we have to pay attention to a lot of small details um you know different medications and things like that and, and human beings um and deer hunting is a lot of the same way you have to pay attention to a lot of small details that add up into bigger things, be it your access, um, simply how you set a tree stand up. You know, like over time you'll notice too that you get better at, you know, how to pick trees or, you know, where you need to be for shot angles. Um, a big one that I see um, is, you know, rookie hunters, like how they set their tree stands up, like where do they hang their bowl. Um, uh, when I get into a tree stand, I try and replicate everything the same every time. You know, I I put my bow hanger over my left shoulder. It's one of those, you know, like pulled out bow hangers over right. my left shoulder. Bow hangs on that. I take my quiver off. I don't shoot with my quiver on if I can help it. And I hang that on a on the lower right hip. I put my fanny pack around the tree with my claws on my left. You know what I mean? So it's it's the same every time. I have my range finder hanging over my right side shoulder. So I just have to reach up and you know the cord's perfect so that I click it you know right in front of my right eye. Um, these things, like, I set it up the same every time I'm in a tree so that when a deer comes in, a buck I want to shoot, I don't have to think about all, any of that. It's just all kind of automatic where things belong, you know. It's the same thing in your your hunting packs or how you pack your stuff in. If you don't have a system, you get in there and you're kind of fumbling around, you're making more noise, it's dark, it's cold, um, you know, it's just it, it's kind of beating you before you even start. So it's you really have to, uh, I, at least I think, um, pay attention to all those little specifics, and they can really add up to uh, 
to helping you out. If, you know, when it finally comes time, you hear it all the time. I finally had my shot and I blew it, you know. And a lot of that comes down to your mental preparation, like how much have you practiced, how much have you, you know, your how you have things set up at the time that that buck comes through. You know, are you ready? Um, are you on your cell phone, which I probably was when he came running by. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I know that was a topic of discussion, and I thought that was funny. But, yeah, I'm, I'm guilty of, of using the smartphone on tree stands. So. Right. Um, no, I it's, think... It's all those, those little things add up to big things. You know, your attitude, your mindset, your preparation, it, it all makes a difference. Yeah, I agree with all that. Because uh, your mind can play a lot of tricks on you from a confidence standpoint as you're accessing your your area you want to set your stand up or as you're getting set up if you're not particularly focused um, you can have you know you might get down early or you might start to move yeah. in your stand and then all of a sudden there's that that buck that you, you know you, you were planning on seeing but you weren't quite confident that was going to it was going to show up you know exactly exactly yep mindset's a big part of it i think cool so, how, uh, for some of us other family guys, I mean, obviously you're spending a lot of time out and, I have the and best, uh, before you start, I have the best wife ever. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what sort of, uh, what sort of reward plan do you give your wife to allow you to be out on the, <laughs> on the road tracking these different properties? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, well, like I said, it's networking. You know, I did a lot of that. Um, when I wasn't married and I had children. And I've actually, you know, over time pulled in a few buddies that, which I call extreme type guys, you know, that I rely on more now heavily that I can't, I cannot travel like I used to. I cannot get away from, you know, my 10-year-old and my 7-year-old, my 5-year-old. I just can't, I cannot do what I used to do as far as time and running around and stuff like that. So now i got to try and be strategic on, you know, like if I'm going to do a camera check, sometimes, you know, I'll do it on a Saturday and, you know, very briefly on a Sunday morning, and I'm checking 15 cameras and walking all day in July. Right. You know, and there's not a lot There's not a lot of guys that are going to do that. By the end of the day, you know, you soak through everything that you're wearing, and you put on a lot of miles in July. Mosquitoes are terrible. Like, So if not that, I have, you know... I probably, you know, have some flexibility in my scheduling because I make it at work, which helps. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as the reward system with my wife, at, at times, definitely in my early 20s, I think definitely was a little bit selfish with my time and, and my priorities, you know, prior to having kids. Um, but once the children come, that you know, you got to shift that around. And you just got to get better at um, when you hunt. You know, like now... Um, before, I wanted to be in the woods every every day, you know. I wanted to hunt all the time. And now, if I can have that opening week or those opening four nights, because I think that's some of the best time of the year to, you know, to, to do a bed-to-feed pattern, to be able to shoot a deer that you've been watching all summer, that's what I asked for. I'm like, you know, can I get these four days, and then the next two weekends we'll do, you know, this family stuff or what have you. Right. It's um, creating that balance. Yeah, yeah, screen the balance, and, you know, I mean, anybody that has 20-plus uh, huge whitetails on the wall um, probably has, you know what I mean, they, they've spent a lot of time, a lot of free time in the woods. Oh, you know, yeah, it's Dan, just, Dan it's admits that when he was younger. and Yeah, you know, it, it, it's part of the nature of the beast. Like, it's you got to make it a priority for it to happen, and... Um, but I think as time goes on, you realize that, and I'm kind of there now, and that's why I'm trying to hunt just specific deer now that, you know, that I learn tendencies over and go after a particular deer is because, um, that's kind of where, you know, like I, like five years ago, if I didn't get my buck, I was just destroyed, you know, like it, it meant everything to me. And now I realize that, you know what, it's probably, it's almost more fun to go watch my daughter in a swim meet than it is to you know, maybe maybe go out on that marginal night and, and hunt, you know. Right. So there's your priorities just shift. You mature as a person. Um, but it still takes takes a lot of time. And you just got to get creative on how you use the time that you're given to maximize your odds. And I think anybody that, 
you know, does that is, you know, deploying trail cameras is a big part of that. Like, it can get you a lot of information. Stan's talked about this. You know, that, that trail camera is in there running for 30 days, you know, 24 hours a day, um, and that can provide you with way more information than two shining trips, you know, that you could take in that 30 days to that area or, or one scouting trip on, on the ground where you hike around for a day. Right. But, and I take my kids with, too. That's the other, you know, another thing that you can do is uh, uh, you get creative and you start taking your children with. And it's, it's so much fun to watch them enjoy something that you enjoy as well. And we've had uh, numerous successful hunts. And then this year, my daughter was 10, and I was so confident that I was going to be able to kill a one-and-a-half-year-old buck with her, and, and we didn't. But we still had fun. Yeah. Um, you know, because it was just family time that we spent in the woods together and, and made special trips and, you know, got special treats or whatever, what have you, you know, and you just made it a fun time with your, with your kids. Yeah. That's a good point to make is involve them in it and build that tradition in them. And, um, right. you know, and that's, that even makes for more enjoyment, uh, as well. Right. So before, uh, I want to talk about the legend of Chubbs a little bit and, and you and your kind of journey of hunting that, that particular deer and, um, you know, it, it sort of ties into how you've evolved to where you are today and, and your goals. So why don't you, I know you did a big write up, a, a really good write up on, on the story of, of hunting him and shared some of the photos and whatnot. So, uh, mm-hmm. if you want to talk about Chubbs a little bit. Sure. Um, that was a piece of property that I acquired a lease to in, uh, 2010. Um, and it's a nice mix of uh, farmland um, to the north, and then on the backside is all that thick brush that you may or may not have seen in one of the, a couple of the pictures that I put up. And then behind that, e- even more, is a huge expanse of marsh with a, a tamarack swamp adjacent to that. So it's it's essentially one of those big chunks of land that I was talking about with very minimal roads and some difficulty accessing deep into it, and that's where you get more mature animals. Um, and fortunately for me, he kind of settled into an area or a core area that I could keep an eye on him and, uh, and hunt him over a couple year period of time. Uh, not to, and it's the funny thing is I think a lot of people think that it's a super low pressure area, but there's three guys that rifle hunt on the hundred acres that I lease, um, the owner and his son and friend, they rifle hunt at the neighboring property. I can, I can think of four or five gun hunters, you know, within 300 yards to the east. Um, be, to, the, to the south, there's another couple gun hunters, and back to the west, there's at least one that I know of for sure. So, I mean, that deer has evaded a lot of different opportunities over the years to stay alive, and I think a lot of that he did by, you know, keeping in the brush. Like, he learned, out, he learned from a young age on, or maybe he had a smart uh, mother or something like that, or just tendencies that, you know, he stayed in that brush most of the time during the daylight and then would come out into the agricultural fields in the evenings. Um, back in 2010, when I first got it, I didn't really get him on uh, the property at that time, but the neighboring landowner did and shared some of the pictures and uh, showed me the antlers from that year. Uh, 2011, I went after him pretty much exclusively, um, but all the pictures now looking back, if I go back and look at the pictures I had of him, they were all... Uh, 10 o'clock, you know, 9 o'clock, very few of them, if any of them, were in the daylight in the, in the areas that I had the camera. Like, he just, uh-huh. you know, I don't know if he was in a different, you know, like, bedding vicinity or he just didn't move as much as a 4-year-old. Uh, you know, he didn't get out of the bed until, you know, right. And Dan explains this, too. Like, sometimes I've hunted back in that brush on the ground, and I've watched these deer get up with 10 minutes of shooting light left, and they just stand there. In, in a bedroom, you know, like I almost shot that one off the ground a couple of years ago. He sat there and sat there. And I'm like, this is a done deal. When he steps up, I'm going to shoot him at 25 yards. And he didn't get up, you know, until it was almost quit time, like dark, 30. <laughs> you know, right. they just, they, they, once they know they're being hunted, they don't move far from that, that bedding area or that, trend, you know, from the bedding out to maybe a, a transition area. If it's thick cover, they might do it a little bit sooner than later, but... Um, a lot of times when they know they're being hunted or there's heavy hunting pressure, they, they stick tight right until dark. 
And that kind of um, it, it that ties yeah. into guys understanding actually how close they need to get sometimes to, to some of those betting areas to be effective. Right. Right. Yeah. So that all kind of, you know, and it just, it was just a learning thing too over the last five years. I can't tell you how many times I've walked through that brush, you know, and uh, you just start to learn. There's a creek on the backside of it out in the marsh, like a big open marsh. And you, you know, it's funny, you walk in those oxbows and all of a sudden there's a huge matted down bed, you know, out, out in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And uh, just a big, big isolated bed. And you're like, okay, that's a buck bedding area, you know. And then um, you find a, a tipped over bigger tree within that brush. And then there's this huge matted area underneath that. And you can kind of tell that that's probably not a doe, you know, that's, that's a buck bedding area. Or, you know, you walk through there and you find just beds all over the place like in a doe bedding area, you know, just pockets of numerous amounts of beds where they're going out to eat and then coming back and laying in the same areas night after night after night. And there's 30 beds in this little vicinity, you know, that's kind of a doe bedding area. And you kind of, over time, put that together, like where where these things are and how they relate to each other. And then now, with Chubbs, did you find sheds in the areas he was bedding in or in a particular bed that he was yeah. bedding? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in 2014, last year, I hit him in that front left leg, um, and I tracked him back into the brush, into that particular one of those blow-down beds, and, you know, I think he just laid on that wound or whatever and got it to, to co- you know, the to clot, right. and I didn't find any blood from that point on, but then that winter, um, if you follow that thread and I got that picture of him after I missed him with the muzzle order, which I don't want to talk about. <laughs> right, um, <laughs> right. um, I, you know, I was looking all over and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to go check that bed. And sure enough, one of his sheds was laying right in that bed. Unbelievable. You now, know, did right you ever bed. think, did you ever, uh, think to yourself, maybe I should, I mean, put a camera up right over a specific bed or you didn't want to get that close. I never tried that just simply because I don't like to walk in that thick brush. As you, as you see in those pictures, I'm in a tree, you know, that's maybe a six to eight inch diameter tree that has a crotch in it. And I'm setting the lone wolf. I'm, I'm like a big bird out in the middle of this brush, you know, I'm just sitting above it. And, uh, I don't like to go to those few trees that are out there that I can actually climb into or small tamaracks unless I'm hunting them because, again, I you know, you have to walk through that thick bedding cover or you have to do something to leave a stink trail that goes right into the core of where these deer are living. And once they smell you back in there, they really don't like that. They'll tolerate you on the edges, out on the agricultural fields, but once you walk back into that cover... Um, you pull a hunt like that, say, on the second or third night of the season, you walk back into that cover and they smell you back there, it's done. They're yeah. not coming out. They're not coming out in daylight anymore. Like, they wait and then, you know, you'll just see it. The opening night, they're out an hour before. The next night, um, maybe you boogered one, like, trying to get out of your tree stand on an edge and, and slid back out. Next night, they're out 25 minutes before dark. And the night after that, it's over. You know, they're, they're, not, they're moving after dark at that point. So, yeah, makes sense. Um, you know, and just with with him, I mean, you know, if you read the story, it's just, uh, 2013, 2012, I didn't, I didn't see him at all that year, but again, lots of camera pictures. I was hunting for him and I ended up, I think, shooting a, a different eight-pointer. Um, 2013, I was all excited and kind of had a plan. I thought I was pinning him down a little bit and then he busted his rack right away. And then 2014, I finally had the opportunity, opening night. I saw him at 50, I think it was 46 yards I ranged him at, standing out, you know, in wide open uh, agriculture. He came out of the corn and fed into that uh, food plot, and he just he was standing there at 46 yards, and I was like, I can't, I can't take that shot ethically um, that evening. And then the next night, um, it was later, and then that other deer kind of, you know, got my boot track and started boogering back into the brush. And I'm like, man, I've been after this deer for years, you know, and he's, again, he's out there at 40 yards in that right. cornfield and it's kind of the same situation. It's like a now or never type thing. And I decided to take the shot and you saw how that ended up. I hit him in the leg and, um, you know, and then he had to 
kind of go through a crappy year that year, I think, because he moved slow for um, 10 or 14 days. But then again, by the rut, he was fully recovered running around. Um, Which is then, amazing in itself of how resilient you know, these guys can be, you know. Right. I mean, that's that's another thing we've learned from cameras, um, buddies and I. Like, if you put a bad hit on them, um, a lot of times if it's close to the rut, even even though if you smacked them dead center in the shoulder and broke that light, you'll still see them out running. Like that that drive to uh, that drive to breed is like just kind of takes over takes over their being. You know, they're, they're hurt bad, but they're still out there trying to breed. It's crazy. So yeah. A lot of times, if they're still alive, they show up on camera. And when this year, when he didn't, you know, after I shot him in that thick brush again and. Um, spent quite a bit of time looking for him. When he didn't show up on camera, I just knew that he was dead. And, uh, you know, I was just eating him. You know, I was having problems sleeping, and uh, I just had to keep keep going out there every chance I could and, and look for him, mainly because, uh, you know, I felt bad about it. And, and number two, it was just such a long story, you know. Like, I couldn't let it end without knowing what happened, you know, like, well, that's the it's big thing that I, I sort of, you know, I respect out of that whole story is the time that after you knew you hit him and you had a really good assumption that he was dead, you know, the time that you spent going back out there to try to find him. I mean, mm-hmm. I guess I, I would hate to say this, but I think a lot of guys, you know, might not give up just due to laziness, but they would just give up due to discouragement you know they well i didn't find him the first couple times i tried and now he's gonna you know he's gone i'm never gonna find him or i you know um so yeah that was to stay consistent and actually and then actually find him and get get the to locate yeah it wasn't it wasn't the best ending but it was you know it was an ending to the to the story um you know, I, I I have a respect for deer, whitetails in particular. I, it just they just boggle my mind um, how smart and complex they are as an animal, and I think that's what drives me a lot of times to try and figure them out and you know and to hunt them, especially in a one-on-one type thing. I think it's it's a really complex you know uh, puzzle or relationship between humans and animals, and especially whitetail deer. They're just super super smart animals to try and try and kill, especially one that's been along, around for that long, um, evading hunters with right long range rifles right. Um, for that many years. So it's, it's, uh, it's definitely a reward. I'm proud of it. Um, I just wish, you know, obviously that the shot would have been a little bit better. And, but I mean, there's no change in that. Yeah. Fact, I mean, but. and obviously we don't, <clears throat> in, you know, everyone, when they're hunting, there's no intent to take a bad shot or, you know, we try to make the best shot as we can, but, right. um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, this has been good. I mean, I think you've shared a, a lot of good information about transitioning from one hunting style to another hunting style on how people can evolve really if they want to, right? Because, right. um, right. everyone's goals are different and it, and that 100 inch deer if that's your trophy that's your trophy and you know those getting any animal or taking any animal for putting food on the table or whatever your goals is is a trophy in anyone's mind right um yeah. but i think you know there's opportunities out there if people want to to set their goals higher and transition into doing other things but what seems really apparent with what you did is being willing to change and to change up what you were doing and what were you were taught as a kid um right and getting outside your comfort zone with it and i think a lot of that is just you know uh information too like i had subscriptions to north american whitetail deer and deer hunting field and stream like you know i read all those all those magazines and I was trying to apply the things that I was reading and the sprays and what have you and this gimmick after that gimmick. But there was really not, like you mentioned it before, back in the 90s, there wasn't as much talk about uh, tactical things or, you know, how to really apply 
topography. Maybe there was, but I just I didn't I didn't read it or I hadn't found it at that point. It wasn't in my face like it is to now, like today. Yeah, unfortunately, um, with and we all know this. I mean, it, but with selling products and and sort of product placement and that thing. In, <laughs> the intent of what they're trying to teach you naturally is going to get skewed, and and no, right. you know anyone that works in that industry. I mean, I I mean, no, I mean no ill will against them or their intent. Um, people right. have products and they believe in them, and they want to sell those products to run a successful business. And I get all that, but I think, yeah, people need to recognize. You need to take some of that stuff for what it's worth. Uh, recognize that they are that they are selling a product, and they are trying to promote to you that this thing works, and it'll get you this buck that you want. But also realize that before those things even existed, people were doing it, and there's specific tactics and techniques that are still tried and true, you know, through current time. Um, right, right, exactly, exactly. And I appreciate, uh, you know everybody's willingness to, uh, especially Dan and uh, others that have contributed a bunch. And that's what I'm trying to do, too. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, like, if people have questions, you know, PM me or, or, you know, I'll give you my personal email. I've had people call me. Like, I'm willing to share information because it, it's fun to me. You know, it's, um, I kind of, I kind of gone through the transition to, um, you know, wanting to get that first big box so that you can show it off to your buddies then wanting to prove that you can do it year in and year out. And then you get to the point, I think, where, you know, like Stan and maybe Joe and some of these other guys, you almost, like, become reclusive. Like, you don't, you know, people think it, it's kind of over the top, you know, when you've killed, say, a dozen or 15 or 20 or 30. Who knows? Like, Stan's probably got 30 big ones. But right. um, after, right. after a while, after a while you, you almost tend to hide them or you don't want to... Um, talk about it as much with um, non-serious hunters just because, you know, you're afraid of, like, my neighbors here, my wife is always scared when we, you know, we moved into a new house and the neighbors come over and they go down in the basement and here's this wall of, you know, 13, 14, 15 heads hanging up, like, what what their perception of, <laughs> of that is, you know? Yeah, you know, there is going to be perceptions out there of it, but I guess those are those people, you know? I, right. I, that's why this there's different levels of anything, and I think hunting is the same thing. You know, it's people do it for different reasons and and pursue things in the outdoors for different reasons. And one thing in particular out of all this that I think people can take home that's really important is is getting out there and and having the courage to go out and find those different properties, ask permission to get access to those different areas, and really utilizing that along with the other tactics that you're learning to to shoot a mature deer if that's what your goal is you know don't limit yourself to trying to shoot a large deer on a piece of property the only piece yeah. of property that you may have access to that quite frankly might not have any mature deer on it right exactly i think that's you know one of the biggest biggest points i try and share with others is you got to be in a location that has the type of animals, and people have said it over and over. Um, you know, you got to be in a location that has the type of animal that you're looking for. Yeah. But uh, overall, I think it's been just a great discussion. I really appreciate, uh, you know, you taking the time to do this. I, you got a family, too, and uh, I know others that have done these podcasts have, you know, taken time out. And I, I appreciate listening to what others had to say. And, um, you know, like you can kind of, after a while, pinpoint different players that might have an area of expertise and you can really, really learn a lot by, you know, listening to other people and kind of studying what they've done or, you know, types of terrain or whatever, whatever kind of technique they're using in their certain areas. It's a lot of, to me, it's a lot of fun. And I think that's why I, you know, I spend so much time in this area because there's a lot of people here with like interests and, I think if you're looking for that in your, you know, in your little neck of the world, wherever that may be, I just don't know that you're going to find uh, people that, you know, think about whitetail deer hunting almost every day of the year. I agree. I think the beast is pretty unique with how well people treat each other on the forum and just, it's, it's, people get to share their passion 
and uh, sort of to what you commented on when you start talking maybe to the average person about hunting whitetails and and how you're on a quest and you've already taken this many and you're still looking for this one or this one yeah you do get weird looks sometimes and people don't share that same passion or may not understand it but um and that's the unique thing about the forum and I appreciate it too. I learn a lot from doing these things. I mean, every time I talk to to one of you guys and do one of these interviews, it's it's been like that. So, um, it's good. Yeah. So with that, uh, you know, we can wrap it up again. Like we mentioned, um, this will be on the forum on the huntingbeast.com, and if you have comments or questions, uh, you can post on there. And you know, I'd really like to thank Josh for taking the time and going over his tactics and thank you too mario for taking the time to do this and uh thanks for, to dan for uh creating a space where us nut jobs can all get together and, <laughs> right. and, and talk talk about uh deer and deer hunting so I, I appreciate it i enjoy it a lot um and to all uh happy new year and uh big success in 2016 i look forward to uh what we're going to come up with next all right very good thank you thanks That concludes today's podcast episode. Please go to thehuntingbeast.com to post any discussions, questions, or comments regarding today's podcast episode.